statements on your behalf. So that is what the adaptive API is. And so the various operations of adaptive APIs is what you would do with any uh, say you know banking related app or any basically money transaction related API. Uh, you have a pre-approval method, so you pre-approve uh, our website to make payments up to a certain amount with a PIN. Uh, you execute payments, that means you transfer payments. You can cancel your pre-approval, uh, you can also refund. So if I paid my uh, landlord a certain amount and you know, he, uh, uh, I asked for a certain portion back, you can either refund the entire or partial amounts. And all these operations are associated with uh, what they call IPN, which is basically PayPal telling us, the application, what operation they did on the user's behalf. And it is very critical to the whole thing because anytime money is involved, there is accountability. And you need to keep track, we as an app developer and PayPal needs to keep track of these transactions. And that is what IPN does for you. It gives you all the details, what appears on your bank statement basically appears after every call you make to PayPal. And I wanted to show in this slide basically what I mean by <coughs> pre-approvals and why the protocol with PayPal also is so critical to us. Uh, the most important thing about uh, our surveys of our users, whether it is Gmail or Yahoo Mail or PayPal, uh, the number one issue is they do not want to provide passwords to us as app developers. So, for instance, if you are doing a PayPal operation, they do not want to give us their PayPal password. So, these adaptive APIs and OAuth for Gmail and Yahoo Mail, they do essentially the same thing, which is the user comes to our site shown on the left and you are transferred over to PayPal and you, op you basically do the rest of the pre-approval or the rest of the process on PayPal's secure site and what is handed back to us, the website is a key. And essentially with that key, we perform the operations on the user's behalf. So in essence, even with Gmail and Yahoo Mail, you are never supplying Infineer.com, any of your critical passwords. And when you have a pre-approval key, you can always revoke it on Google or Yahoo or so, those two things are very critical for consumer adoption. So, just to give you an idea of you know uh, how simple it is to really use the adaptive API, uh, what I wanted to show the on the top, I mean this really this piece of Java code which pretty much is uh, making a payment. Uh, what you need is the pre-approval key which is step 2 the sender who is sending it, the pre-approval key that you know we got from PayPal on your behalf and the, who are you sending it to, the amount and finally the PIN uh, that you know you are using to authorize this payment. So if you have all these pieces from the user and how you got it from the user, I mean we use prompts in some case, uh, in the case of emails. You, we, we allow you to pay invoices. So, if you get an invoice from a vendor and we are reading out the email to you, you can just say pay and you enter the PIN and we figure out the amount and all the other details from the email itself. So, you, but in essence under the covers what we are supplying to PayPal is you know the receiver's email, the amount, the PIN, the pre-approval token, the whole nine yards. So, I just wanted to show in this Java code that you know it is very easy to use. There are PHP and Perl examples too and integrating with asterisk is really simple. The particular problem as I mentioned when you are dealing with high latency web services is uh, you want to hide the latency from the user. So what I wanted to show you was you know you have this async AGI mechanism 
and we are invoking this uh, Perl script, this AGI script V2B sender and its goal is to send all the details that I just uh, showed you in this slide. So basically we have all the details from the user, now we have to make a payment, we invoke this AGI script to call out to PayPal, but it takes you know 5 to 10 seconds. Uh, so we want to do it asynchronously and do something else. We do a lot of bookkeeping and uh, you know internal stuff regarding the transaction. You can also play some music to the user, but you know we have to synchronize like you know wait for the response and we can proceed only when you get the response from PayPal. So we had this unique problem with async AGI scripts in general, like how do you synchronize? And in our case, we chose, uh, there are several alternatives you can use, memory based mechanisms for uh, fork and join, or you can use file based, we went the file based approach. And the reason is our entire backend basically takes a voice file as input and generates a voice file as output. So for us, synchronizing using files was very natural. So anytime we do a call out to web service through an AGI script, we are essentially waiting for a particular file to you know, reach a certain size or have a certain string in it. And I'll show you the exact script that we use. So this is the, uh, so the last line is the wait for response. So that's the join part and that's the lock output file. So in essence, it's the simple shell script that you know waits for a file to appear in the file system. And when the file in this case, when it reaches a certain size, you, uh, maybe it's a wave file you, or an MP3 file, then it's ready to go. You can start playing it. Uh, if it is, uh, you know, a particular response that you're waiting from PayPal, uh, you can, you know, put it into a file, grab for it, and only quit when uh, you get a particular response. You could also make it, you know, you could have uh, lots of alternatives that are memory-based alternatives. You could use, you know, queues in memory to also do the join. But this was the simplest we found. Uh, just the last few details on, you know, some internal parts of the system. And uh, there's one very key aspect of our speech recognizer that's unique to us, which is we can switch the grammar, the vocabulary of the recognizer on every input. And the reason is my contacts are different from yours, and we are a totally stateless system, so we don't keep a recognizer around built for you, but we build one on the fly in memory on every request. And how we do it is with our custom engine. I want to contrast that with, say, the transcriber you get with the Google Android system. Uh, that is a static recognizer. It recognizes a very large language, but it's static. You cannot insert your names or your contacts' names into Google's recognizer. So that's a very clear distinction we had right from the beginning, which is, We'll focus on names and contacts, and we'll let Google focus on transcription, Google Nuance, or Vlingo. Uh, just the last part of my presentation, I wanted to go over, you know, why this is such a big deal to us. The fact that, you know, there was a huge cost reason, and there is the global deployment reason. So uh, all our low-cost services, which is free access to email especially is mostly focused on Asia and uh, all the other smartphone users which doesn't use the asterisk stack is mostly focused on you know the US and Europe. So we found Amazon to be you know very easy to deal with in terms of the number of instances that you can have. So I wanted to go over some key pieces of you know the Amazon cloud story and why it fits in very well with asterisk. Voxilla has a tutorial on deploying asterisk on Amazon, uh, which pretty much, you know, works out of the box. Uh, 
uh, what they describe in their tutorial. But what you need to know is an AMI is a particular instance, uh, it is a particular server, one instance of a server. You have different types of storage, there is EBS and S3 and you have load balancing, but that is only HTTP load balancing and you can create these policies that you can say that you know I want an additional 20 servers to be brought up automatically with my code running on it when demand reaches 60 percent on my current pool of servers. So, if I have five servers running and capacity or load reaches 70 percent, then you can add additional instances and spread the load across the new instances. So, that is their whole elastic part to the EC2 uh, story, fits in very well with asterisk except one key piece is missing. HTTP load balancers, there are tons of them, there is hardware, there is software and in Amazon you get it declaratively. So, you do not even know uh, the load balancer, you just write your policies, uh, but what is missing is the SIP load balancer. So, that is where we had to throw in uh, asterisk. And then the rest of the stack is your vanilla, you know, app stack. There is, you know, it's LAMP. So the usual, it's all our custom Java code. But the key point I wanted to highlight was they have data centers spread out. They have no data centers in South America, but pretty much they cover uh, the whole world. And for us, the Singapore data center and you know its coverage of India and China, especially with the cell phone users was pretty critical. Uh, we have not leveraged it yet with a product for Asia, but that is part of the goal. And uh, some of the numbers, I do not know whether you can see them out there, they have all changed, but the current uh, products that we have, uh, like you know the number of users registered, I mean Gmail is like 150 million users, Yahoo Mail is upwards of 300. Facebook, that is a very old number, it is uh, crossed 520 million. So, the solutions that we are providing, I mean uh, PayPal is 70 million active PayPal users. So, we are talking about solutions that kind of, you know, fit into uh, a huge population. And some of the, I want to wrap up the talk with some of the things we learned. Uh, one of the key things is there is smartphone versus voice calls. Uh, they really, you know, we are a server based solution and we try to keep the uh, client part of it very light and uh, especially with voice recognition, uh, server based is easier. And I think when you are designing applications, you got to be very clear about what percentage of your uh, user base is going to be smartphone based, which is IP, HTTP versus, you know, SIP and voice traffic. Uh, the, uh, I mean, our smartphone app users, so the, uh, out of 20,000 users that we surveyed uh, who, you know, used our product and uh, filled out a form on our website. Uh, about 95 percent of them from the U.S. So, if you are talking about the U.S. users only, 95 percent of them wanted a smartphone solution, IP based. Uh, when you looked at the rest of the world, 70 percent of the users wanted uh, a voice based solution in Asia especially. So, the smartphone versus normal phone thing, you know, is very, very uh, distinct. So, we are going to have an Android app soon, uh, it is going to be cheap or very cheap free, but the, so the iPhone app is going to be really expensive and the reason is you do not have the stack on the iPhone and uh, Apple is not going to be supporting Gmail very well and that is our focus, you know, uh, Gmail. And uh, PayPal, uh, there were, when we were looking at uh, payment solution and monetizing our own app, uh, there were a lot of alternatives out there. 
uh, you may have heard of bling nation and zong and 